In light of the controversy coming out from the docuseries Hillsong and Megachurch Exposed, it's led many of us to have some pressing questions. Should Christians separate worship music from the artist who wrote the worship song? Is worship music being used to emotionally manipulate the audience? Has creativity in worship songwriting gone just a little bit too far? And it's not just Hillsong. Mega ministries like Bethel and Elevation have been dabbling in some questionable theology as of late. Should Christians even listen to music from problematic ministries? So on this video, Alan invited me to have a candid conversation about the crisis in worship music. Well, hey, 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 what's going on, everybody? It's Alan Parr here with my good friend and brother, Ruslan. How you doing, man? Man, I'm doing good. Good to be here with you, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, man, it is a pleasure. Hey, guys, so look, check this out. Um, just in case you guys think that we as YouTubers are just a whole bunch of guys that just kind of crank videos out, we don't know each other. I had the privilege and the honor of meeting this brother, um, I'd say about <laughs> a year ago, maybe about a year ago or so. Uh, and man, at first we were just, you know, chopping it up on YouTube, just talk, talking about different things that we're doing. Uh, really just kind of honoring each other and uh, encouraging each other. But it really grew into an actual friendship. The brother came out here to Dallas. We hung out, we grabbed some lunch, and uh, we talk about family, talk about life, talk about all sorts of things. So, man, I just want to let you know that I'm proud of you. You're crushing it, man. Super excited about what God is doing in your ministry, and I'm thankful for your friendship, brother. Alan, thank you so much, man. And, and, and guys, just, just know, man, Alan is one of the most helpful brothers behind the scenes for so many Christian creators, and myself included. And uh, I'm just grateful for your mentorship. I'm grateful for your support. Uh, just all the, I, I can, we can't get into all the particulars, man, but, but you've been such a blessing in terms of just thinking on a macro vision, thinking of family first and keeping that my main ministry and always challenging me, encouraging me in that area. So I'm very grateful for you, man. Thank you so much for having me. Oh man, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well guys, listen, uh, we are not gonna waste your time. Uh, we're gonna jump right in and get into the discussion. But before we do, uh, if you are watching this on the replay, then timestamps are going to be below uh, in the description so you can skip around. Uh, hopefully you'll watch the whole video. It's going to be an exciting conversation. But if you're one of those people who like to dip and dab and kind of skip around, uh, shortly after this video is released, there'll be timestamps in the video, uh, video description. You can check it out. Also, there'll be a link for you to subscribe to Roost Launch channel. I can't imagine any of you who are watching my channel are not already subscribed to Ruslan, but if you're not, I really encourage you to go check him out. Uh, he and I do some crossover content, but uh, a lot of it is uh, he's God's really given him a vision to, to reach this next generation, uh, really talking about pop culture, theology, things going on, but from a biblical worldview. So if you're not familiar, go check him out right there. I put a link to some of his merchandise as well so you can support his ministry because we need you all support as well. Uh, so uh, we're gonna put all that in the description. But uh, let's jump in, man, to the conversation. So what we wanna talk about, because there's been so many things going on, you all, uh, over the last couple of years, I mean, you've had major artists who have uh, deconstructed their faith. And first of all, do me a favor, guys, if you can hear me okay, if everything is good from the audio, uh, let me know if you're having any issues. I'm checking the chat right here, and we don't want to get into the conversation if we're having any issues with audio. So if there's any issues, uh, let us know, and that way we'll be able to adjust it. Uh, but if I don't hear from you, no news is good news. So check this out, guys. Over the past couple years, listen, there's been a lot of things going on, right? Uh, a lot of stuff with Bethel, Hillsong, Elevation, all sorts of videos out there about whether Christians should or should not listen to this music, whether churches should be streaming their music, or excuse me, uh, singing their music in their worship uh, sets, and what that might um, cause people to, to go check out their ministries and things like that. Are you supporting these ministries financially? All this and that. You've had major people from uh, different um, groups like Hillsong who were prominent worship leaders and they've now since deconstructed or pretty much walked away from the faith. Uh, and, and now you, you know, Hillsong exposed, megachurch exposed. And so there's just a lot of stuff going on with worship. So uh, Russ and I, we want to just chop it up and talk a little bit about that, but also kind of leave you all with some good things to, to think through as you're kind of navigating this whole thing. Uh, Russ, you want to add anything to that before we kind of lay out the lay of the land for today? 
Yeah, I, I think this conversation really is a felt need that as we were paying attention to some of the DMs coming in after the Hillsong Exposed conversation, we were paying attention just to some of the, the questions in the comments. I posted this on my community tab, and there's so many questions that pose some of this dilemma in terms of how uh, some of these mega ministries have structured themselves, which is brilliant from a marketing standpoint to build the music side and the art side. Uh, but then it could get problematic in how it's all executed. As, as you know, Alan, many churches have this thing called a CCLI license, where they're paying an annual membership or a monthly membership based on the size of your church. So there's revenue coming in if these songs are getting sung in your local churches. So it's such a multi-layered, confusing topic, but it really is coming to me from folks that are looking at what's going on. And they're just like, ah, I'm seeing some of the stuff from Hillsong Exposed docuseries. I'm hearing, I watched Mike Winger's video on Bethel and Phil Johnson's theology in the areas he's off, yet we're singing these songs. And where do I draw the line? Where do we draw that line between, okay, this is artistic versus wait a minute, this is pushing some really serious error in theology. And, and how do we navigate those conversations? And I thought, who better to have this conversation with than you, Alan? You have a ministry background in terms of being a worship leader, but you also went to Dallas Theological Seminary, which is one of the best you know seminaries out there. So you're equipped in, I think, the both the arts as well as the uh, theology side to bring a good balance to this conversation. Man, I appreciate that, man. Well, let, let's, let's, let's jump in and... Um... So guys, uh, we have a little bit of an agenda here today, but you know, this is just a basic conversation. I just like to kind of um, uh, have something prepared for you guys. And we call this the worship music debate. And um, it's not a debate between Ruslan and I. So if you tune, tuned in thinking that, you know, R Russ and I are going to try to debate each other, it's more so the debate that we really want to get to, which is this idea of should Christians listen to music from quote unquote problematic ministries, right? Where their theology might be off, but the song itself that you might be listening to is good, right? And so we're going to get into that. And that is the ongoing debate. You have some people that are like, no, 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 absolutely not. You're supporting these ministries. And you have other people on the other side and they're like, hey, at the end of the day, it edifies me spiritually. So what's the big deal, right? So this is the ongoing debate and people feel very strongly about that. So uh, what we're going to look at today, first and foremost, y'all, is what is worship? I mean, because we talk a whole lot about worship, worship music, worship in church, things like that. What is worship? And then the second thing that we're going to look at is what role should creativity play in songwriting, right? And so when you think about that, uh, there's a reason why I want to bring this up, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So what role, if you're writing songs, if you're an artist, uh, what role should creativity, how creative can you be? How much can you push the envelope, right? and still be theologically sound. And then the third one I want to look at, and we're going to build it up, all right, because the one we really want to get to is really this last one, and we're going to save the best for last, all right? But the third one is, what's the difference between emotionalism and true worship? Mm -hmm. Because that's a key one, because when you're in church, you, it's like, okay, are they just doing all this stuff to, to play on my emotions and manipulate hmm. me emotionally? Or is this true, heartfelt, genuine, authentic worship? So I'm going to look at a couple things, and Russ and I are going to have a discussion about that. And then um, Russ is going to have, have some thoughts about, should we separate the art from the artist, right? I mean, should we just look at the art that this person is putting out, or should we consider the artist, their uh, you know, their, their morality, uh, their, their personality, their character, right? Or should we just isolate them? And then finally, the one we want to look at, we're probably going to spend a lot of time on is, should Christians listen to music from problematic ministries? So uh, that's where we're going to go. And also after that, we're going to take any questions that you guys have as well. So uh, Russ, um, what is worship, man? What is worship? Tell me what it is. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, we talk a lot about worship, but what, what does that word actually mean? And uh, let me know when you want to uh, want me to show the scriptures. Yeah, I think in our modern day context, we tend to compartmentalize worship to primarily music and to a vertical expression of awe, of praise, of reverence, 
of adoring Jesus, ador adoring God, right? And so Jesus, when he prays, he says, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name, thy kingdom come, right? So there's a vertical component to worship. But I think sometimes we've probably erred in making worship primarily just about the music on the Sunday morning, those first couple songs. And maybe we have a worship playlist that we like to listen to when we're feeling sad and depressed and it'll lift us up. And we tend to kind of compartmentalize, but if we're looking at the macro vision of what the scriptures teach, I think worship is substantially way more than just a genre of music. It's way more than just, you know, emotional love songs to Jesus, that, that worship really is our lifestyle. And if we look at Romans chapter one, uh, verse one and two, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice because in the Old Testament, they did, I'm going through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, they would do burnt offerings and all these sacrifices. But he says, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper act of worship. This is your true and proper worship. So worship is us glorifying God, not with just singing, but with our lifestyle, with our day-to-day -day lifestyle. And then the music really becomes a soundtrack to what we're living day-to-day, -day, Alan. The things that I'm meditating on, I'm going to want my music to reflect that. It doesn't make no sense for me to live in a way where I'm following Jesus, I'm pressing into his word, I'm meditating on the scriptures, I'm, I'm listening to other uh, pastors and you know creators that are affirming that, but then I'm going to listen to something that's totally outside of the realms of what I'm actually trying to change and, and, and direct my, the trajectory of my life in a way that's honoring God. So the music becomes an overflow of that, in my opinion. I think it's just a, a soundtrack for my life. And so I think this really is the crux is I think we got to get away from just the genre. It's not just a genre of music. It's not just something that you classify at the Grammys, right? And it, it is a lifestyle. And then the music becomes the soundtrack for that lifestyle. Yeah, and I love what you said because oftentimes we can also make the mistake that worship is something that only happens in church on Sunday mornings, yep, right? Yep. But if worship is truly a lifestyle, then not only should your entire life reflect it, but you should also be what I consider called practicing the presence of God throughout the day, right? And I Come know on. many of you watching this, you, you don't just wait till Sunday morning. You're already doing this, right? Because this is key. Right. So what you want to make sure that you're doing is you want to stay in that state of worship. You want to be in your car worshiping God. If y'all if, if y'all caught me driving down the highway and, and y'all saw like me in my car, y'all probably think Brother Allen is weird because sometimes I'm in there shouting. I'm in there praising. I'm in there lifting my hands. You might even see tears coming down my and, and this isn't trying to impress anyone because there's nobody else but me in the car. Right. So worship should be a lifestyle that we live and uh, it, it should be our matter of fact, I heard somebody say it this way. Worship is when everything I am responds to everything God is. Oh, that's good, man. Think about that. When yeah. everything I am, my heart, my mind, my soul, my body, my efforts, my affection, my money, my finances, everything, my mind, when everything I am responds to everything who God is, he's just, he's faithful, he's kind, he's loving, he's patient, he's long suffering. He's omnipresent. He's sovereign, right? When we, when everything we are responds and reacts to everything God is, that's worship. And we should yeah. stay in that state. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome guys. Well, let's, let's, let's take a look at this next one. Let's take a look at this next one because this is one that I want to, I, I want to touch on here. And, uh, this question here is what role should creativity play in songwriting? So if there's any of you out there and you are a songwriter, right? The question is, how can you, all right? So the question is, how can you be creative with your songwriting, whether you're a rapper, whether you're spoken word, whether you're a poet, whether you are actual song, a, a song, a songwriter, how can you be creative and still be theologically accurate, but not just say the same old things about God all the time. Because if you're a creative person, you want to find new and fresh ways to express yourself to God so that it's it's different. But when is that going a little bit too far, right? And so um, there's a song that, I, 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 that you guys might be familiar with. And um, I just kind of want to look at some lyrics. And I want you all to tell me whether this is going too far or not, all right? There's a song, I think it's called We Dance by Hillsong 
or it might be Bethel. I think it might be Bethel. We dance. I think it's by Bethel. Yeah. And these are the lyrics. Okay. You steady me slow and sweet. We sway, take the lead and I will follow. Finally ready now to close my eyes and just believe that you won't lead me where you don't go. And then it goes on to say, uh, when my faith gets tired and my hope seems lost, you spin me around, spin me round and round and remind me of that song. Russ, you laughing. The one you wrote for me. Chorus. All right, we dance. Oh, we dance. I've been told to pick up my sword and fight for love. Little did I know that love had won for me. Here in your arms, you steal my heart again. And I breathe you in like I've never breathed till now. All right. So, uh, so okay. So I'm going to be straight on, honest with you. I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull it out. Okay. I'm going to go back here just a little bit. Now, I don't know about you brothers, no offense, but I don't know one brother who's going to feel comfortable <laughs> singing this song in worship. I don't know any brother out there who's, who's, who's straight. Okay. Who's straight, who wants to be in worship service visualizing dance slow dancing with jesus christ right steadying me slow and sweet oh mm -hmm. jesus we sway and take the lead and i will follow and i'm ready to close my eyes and 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 let you lead me and and i want you to spin me round and round like we're on a dance floor jesus <laughs> right and, and because it reminds me of that song that you wrote for me jesus and and here in your arm you steal my heart again mm -hmm. now i understand I understand where the songwriter is coming from. It's all figurative language to suggest that, you know what, I, I want to respond to the love. But I'm sorry, y'all. Stuff like this, in my mind, just takes it a little bit too far with creativity because it leans into this idea of romanticism, mm -hmm. right? Come on. Where, where when you can start to replace your boyfriend's name with Jesus, and it sounds Ooh. like a secular song, right? Jesus or, or Johnny here in your arms. Johnny, you steal my heart again. And Johnny, I breathe you in like I've never. When it starts to happen like that, I just think creativity is gone a little too far. But I'm going to pass it over to Russ because, yeah. Russ, I know you're a songwriter. So let me know your thoughts and let me know if you want me to leave <laughs> it up there. <laughs> well, well, you know, this is one of the things that I've struggled with, Alan. And I'm not, I don't mean to get like super deep on this, but there is this emasculation that often happens in much of church culture. And if you're a masculine man, for first of all, if you're a masculine man, you're not walking around telling everybody you're a masculine man, right? But if you're a masculine man and just a guy's guy, um, and then the, you step into a church environment and the vast majority of the songs sound like these soft rock love songs to Jesus, as if Jesus is my boyfriend vibes, it could, that that could be a stumbling block for a lot of men, and I think this is this is, in my opinion, maybe why this is happening. And I don't know if why, but 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 they say that a lot of women tend to be bigger consumers in terms of church stuff, you know, in terms of consumption, in terms of buying these albums, in terms of that sort of thing. So I don't know if there's some of that being played into it. I'm not sure what it is, but I've always wrestled with, first of all, like why does all of quote unquote worship music feel like the same genre it all just feels like soft rock right and in, in, in this like emo soft rock sound and then why yeah why is it so romanticized and and weird and, and like sappy i've always wrestled with this and and oddly enough i think this is one of the reasons we've seen maverick city explode as fast as they have is because it's a flip on what it's like it's like just safe enough but it's also different enough where they're blending in some black gospel they're blending in some hip-hop they're blending in some different some pop music to kind of repackage this stuff and it's not as as um i don't know how else to say it it's not it's not as feminine and this is no diss to the ladies but it's not as feminine so as a man it's very difficult for me to sing a song that sounds like a love song to jesus right it, it just it just feels bizarre and some people 
will go uh, down a really bizarre slippery slope with some of this and they'll read song of songs as like an allegory and it's like this romantic and it's like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. like we we have to slow your roll because men are going to struggle with this sort of stuff men are going to struggle with singing these types of lyrics on a sunday morning and if we if we're complementarianism and again i'm not trying to go super deep but if we believe men is the head and we believe ephesians chapter five this is going to get into a really murky place with turning men away from wanting to participate in corporate worship and so this has always been a struggle of mine alan and as far back as i can remember is walking in and um uh, it just it's like man this 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 feels like a soft rock concert the worship leader feels like a rock star ah it doesn't it doesn't feel very reverent you know it, it, and it's confusing and so i think i think addressing this sort of stuff is is healthy it's not to dunk on these people and and we should be creative right. god we serve a creative god god is we created everything created the universe so we should be creative however at at what expense at, at the expense of like swap out a couple of these lyrics and it turns into a regular love song right like, i mean this is what happens like this this is a wedding song this is some, a song that someone can walk down the altar at their wedding i don't i don't know if it's a, i don't know if worship that's sang in a corporate setting as the local ecclesia church is isn't is supposed to be that way yeah yeah and i'm with you i mean you know when you start looking at lyrics where it talks about dancing with jesus and everything you know, you also have to ask the question, you know, how biblical is it, right? I mean, you, you know, is it really biblical? I mean, like, is there any anything in the Bible where Jesus is dancing with someone or or anything like that? Like, is that, you know, so yes, be creative, right? But for instance, um, you know, when I think about creativity, I think about like people like Chris Tomlin, who have written some amazing uh, lyrics and some amazing songs. Um, you know, there's some amazing songwriters out there who are very, very creative and descriptive in how they and how they express themselves towards God or how they describe God. Right. Um, uh, you know, awestruck my knees uh, uh, as we humbly proclaim this. You are amazing. God. You know, like Chris Thomas has some songs like indescribable, whatever, like like there's ways to be very creative without going into the romanticism, which leads me into this next thing that I really want us to talk about here to kind of keep this thing rolling. And, and that, that is guys, the difference between emotionalism and true worship. So that, that's what I want to camp out on here a little bit as we kind of move this thing along is you're in church and it's high. I mean, it's super high and it's really, really uh, authentic. How do you start to distinguish between is this church or worship leader using emotional manipulation tactics, tactics rather, to, to hype me up and to get me to feel or experience something emotionally? Or whether is this a tender, genuine, authentic, heartfelt moment of worship? Okay. Now, guys, the reason why I'm passionate about this, you may have heard me say this before. But you guys may or may not know, but for 12 years before I started on YouTube, I was a worship leader. I started on YouTube in 2015. And so I started leading worship in 2002 and kept doing it until about 2016 or so. So about 14 years, I was a worship leader all the way in hardcore, did it four Sunday, you know, four services Sunday, like all that, right? So, so I have a lot of experience in this. And I want to take a look at a few things, okay? First key point that I want us to look at is emotions are good and yeah. worship should be emotional. So I want to be yes. clear on that point, right? That in, in expressing your emotions during worship is good and worship should be emotional. Once again, when everything you are responds to everything God is, when you start thinking about who God is in your life, how he's forgiven you, how he's taken you over the mountains, how he's blessed you, how he's gotten you out of difficult situations in life, how you've let him down or not let him down, but how you've displeased him and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all that stuff. And, and, and you start to think about the grace and mercy of God. Oh man. Yes. It's going to yep. be emotional, right? It's going to be emotional. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I think sometimes those of us that are really into the word, really into theology, are, are deep thinkers. Sometimes this is where we probably err, Alan, is that we're afraid to open ourselves up and be vulnerable in worship. And like the same way, man, we 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 work out to worship uh, in the in the gym when when I'm working out, when I'm driving, and I think there's something healthy about being sober 
how good this good news really is and how far gone I was and how God re rescued us and, and, and just to cross and all that kind of stuff. I think it's a, it's a healthy place to sometimes allow ourselves to go there emotionally that sometimes those of us that are really into, into theology, into the Bible study, into those things, sometimes we could close ourselves off, but you're right. My, my, uh, I got a, a amazing, a Christian therapist named Dr. Rudy. And he says that emotions are messengers and that your emotions aren't good or bad. They're messengers to something that's going on. And so if you're thinking of of the gospel and you're emotional that's because the gospel is an emotional powerful message and those are your 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 emotions sending you messages that yeah you should be in awe of god you should be grateful for what he did on the cross you should be grateful that he that he rescued you made you know renewed you gave you a new life a new heart so I think being emotional is is okay. It's just is the are the emotions being manipulated? Are there things being done in an environment to intentionally uh, drive a specific outcome in in a specific institution? And I think that's where it can get problematic because. Yeah, we want to speak to people's emotions. We want to speak to people's senses, smell, audio, visual, the whole bit. But I think we could really start to slide away from the actual heart of worship if it's just about an emotional reaction. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and so guys, because I've led worship and I've been in this in this space for a long time, I'm going to give you some specific ways that I think many worship leaders, and if you're a worship leader out here, this is meant to be no disrespect, but this is meant to be just an encouragement for you. All right. And um, uh, uh, and so just a few different things that I want you to look out for and pay attention to. And you might even feel the need. You know, God may lead you to, to bring these concerns up to your church. Right. But the first thing that that you may want to look at for emotional manipulation is equating external emotions with true worship. And I apologize for the small text on the screen, but equating external emotions with true worship. Now, what do I mean by that? Oftentimes, worship leaders assume that if the place is emotional, then that equates to, oh, we had great worship. And so because they think that great authentic worship must be displayed through a outpouring of extremely high worship and praise, then they will work and, and stop at no, at nothing to try to make that happen because in their minds, that's what worship is all about. But they will look past the person that's in the back of the sanctuary who might have their head in their hands and they are overcome by the grace of God and the mercy of God. And they may not say a word. They might be very, very quiet. They may not shout. They may not run. They may not dance. They may not do any of that. But they are having an encounter with God, a moment with encounter. But that worship leader may not sense that true worship is happening because it's not out there super loud. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I, and I would say much of our Sunday morning experience kind of kind of puts us at the center of things, Alan, where the the, the the seats are comfortable, the music volume is just right, you know, the the, the equipment, the LED wall, no, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. I went back uh, to a, to the church I grew up in, Ar Armenian Orthodox. I grew up Armenian Orthodox, and there's all kinds of things I have issues with them on, on some theology and some teaching that they have. But Alan, I found it so interesting that the, the, the building and the architecture of the building was intended to bring vertical worship to God, that the the organ and the, the the choir was actually on a balcony behind us, so you couldn't see them. And then the the, the dead hired who was leading the worship at the end of the service was behind a curtain. And so the entire thing was not intended to put us at the center as people. It was intended for you not to even acknowledge that there's someone else leading you in these, these hymns and these really intense sounding songs, that the experience is intended to not make you comfortable instead it's meant to make you stand up and not be comfortable so that you could remember why you're ultimately there and i think sometimes folks get it right in this area where we might make it a little too consumeristic a little too let's make sure that the the, the, the chairs are cushy we don't want people to stand for too long we don't want you to be right and i think i think it's an and both i think there needs to be a vertical reverence um uh, because it's really not about you in worship it's about god that's that's why we're there to worship it's not about you it's about god and it's about praising and giving him worship with with our with our music and our time yeah no doubt no doubt all right y'all so this is the second thing i want to talk about and this one's huge 
Worship leader coerces people into certain actions that should be internally motivated. So look, we've all been in churches where the worship leader is commanding people to do certain things, right? The worship leader is basically saying, uh, I want everybody in here right now to lift your hands. I want everybody in here to give God a shout of praise. I want everybody in here to bow before the Lord. I want everybody here to make as much noise as possible, right? So what are they trying to do? Well, first of all, you can't make somebody shout. Or I guess you, you, why would you want people to shout when internally they don't want to shout, Mm -hmm. right? What if I just had a fight with my wife and I just barely made it to church? And the worship leader starts off the service and he's like, he or she's like, come on, if you, and then, and then it leads me to the third one here, which I'll talk about in a second, but they guilt trip you if you don't do it. If you really love Jesus, right? (laughs) Give the Lord a shout of praise up in here, right? Or I want everybody in here to lift your hands. Why would God want me to lift my hands if I don't feel like lifting my hands? Lifting my hands should be intrinsically motivated. It should be something that I do because I'm offering a, um, a sign of surrender to God. I'm saying, God, just like a police officer who just pulled me over, I put my hands up, I surrender unto you. Or God, just like a little child who's reaching out for something because they have open hands and they want to receive something from their mother and father. God, I'm coming to you with open hands, ready to receive whatever. Or God, I'm giving you whatever uh, that, that I'm trying to give you something, right? So that... It, raising your hands and and worshiping God and and whatever posture, kneeling down should never be something that a worship leader coerces or forces you to do. It should be something that is happening internally in your mind. Yeah. And I think there's also nothing wrong, Alan, if everybody's standing and you want to sit and get low or you want to get on your face, that's okay. If everybody's on their face and you want to stand and lift your hands, that's okay. I think sometimes we, we do let the room dictate and guilt trip people into reacting a certain way. And that could be unhelpful. I, I will say this though, and this is something that I think is, is related to context and environment, but I do find it I don't know if I want to say ironic, but problematic that the guys I know that are huge football fans and they're watching the game and they're yelling, yeah, go Cowboys, right? And then they don't want to do anything during worship, right? Like they're just like, yeah, I think that's a bit incongruent as well. Like I think if you're in a context where, man, we're jumping, we're praising, we're, we're excited, not not in a manipulative way, but it's just an upbeat song and you're the guy that never wants to do that, but yet you're that guy at the football game, you're that guy at the basketball Ball game, I think that's a bit incongruent. And if you're going to give praise to your favorite football team, you should be okay with being outwardly expressive to Jesus if it's the appropriate context. Some churches don't do that, right? Like if you do that at the Armenian Orthodox Church I went to a couple weeks ago for my youth, that would be totally inappropriate in that context, <laughs> right? But if you're in a setting where that's that's the normative, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. I think sometimes we can get a little too reserved. And it's like, man, if you're an expressive type of person, don't be afraid to share that expression, that that excitement for for God. Like that that should be okay to to do that. And this is why I I, I appreciate my charismatic brothers and sisters that that don't do it as a manipulation tactic, but they're just excited. Like it's just their culture. They're just ready to go. Yeah. Boom. First song, hands up. They're crying out to God. Like, I think, I think there's something to that. That's good. So I don't think it's an either, or I think it's in context. And I definitely think we got to stay away from the, from the manipulation side, because you can start really tugging on people's heartstrings. And, and, and then when that starts getting driven to, you need to give more, you need to sow a seed, you need to, you need to serve more. I think I go, oh man, Man, like you said, Alan, this should be from the overflow of someone's personal experience with Jesus. Yeah. And, and to that end, y'all. So one of the things that I used to do whenever I was leading worship is I would encourage people, but I wouldn't command them. Right. And I would, and I would teach them because you have to remember people coming into your church, this is for all my worship leaders. They don't know what kneeling means. They don't know what uh, lifting your hands actually represents. They don't know why you should shout or whatever. And so instead of commanding them, try encouraging them. So if you want people to raise their hands, say something like, hey, you know what? If you want to just uh, give a visual uh, sign of surrender to the Lord, I invite you to join us today and lift your hands. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Because you're inviting people. You're telling them, hey, if you want to surrender to God and you want to, to visually demonstrate that to our God and Father who's in heaven, 
I invite you wherever you are to stand with us and join with us. And we invite you to lift your hands as a sign of surrender unto the Lord. Like that's how you phrase it. But you don't mandate and say, hey, if you love Jesus, then you need to lift your hands, which which then leads me into, into this, this next piece here, which is really this idea of worship leader criticizing people for not engaging in certain mm. forms or acts of worship, right? Once again, this is all the emotional manipulation stuff, which is this idea that, you know what, I'm going to create an environment, right? I'm going to create an environment so that anybody who, you have to understand that generally speaking in crowds, people don't like to go against the grain. They don't like to be the person that doesn't fall out and get slain in the spirit. They don't like to be the person that, that is not shouting. They don't like to be the person that's not uh, um, you know, have their hands up because then people take notice of you. Everybody around you has their hands up and you don't. So naturally, like if, if the worship leader can create enough people to do it, then the people that aren't doing it are going to start to feel a little bit awkward as if there's something wrong with them because they don't want to. And so they're just going to naturally, you've been there. You, I know you've been there where you just kind of awkwardly just kind of start lifting up your hands because you don't want to be that person that's not mm -hmm. doing it. Or God forbid you're in a service where everybody is laying hands and everybody's falling out. And then when they come to you, you're deathly afraid because you're like, I don't want to fall out. I don't even know if anybody's behind me to catch me if I fall. I don't even know what's going on, right? Yep. But you but you don't want to be that person that doesn't fall and embarrasses the person who's laying hands. So you just naturally fall out, right? And this is what I'm saying, this emotional manipulation and worship that we have to be careful about. Yeah, that's that's so good, and and I think what you what you said, Alan, in terms of shepherding the congregation and explaining what's happening and why we do certain things, I, I think anybody that's watched that's watching this as a worship leader, that is one of the most tangible things you could do because what it does is it creates a an environment of accommodation and not assimilation. Meaning that a lot of times what's happening in worship, from the genre of music to the things that we do that we don't ever explain why we will lift our hands, we don't ever explain explain why we get on our knees. We just, we're just expecting you to assimilate to our culture and how we do things instead of saying, hey, you know what? You, you may be far from God. You may be unchurched. You may be from a totally different context of church. And I, we're going to shepherd you and explain to you, hey, you know what? This is why we lift our hands. It's a sign of surrender. This is why we get on our knees. It's a sign of, right? I think that's it right there. And that's what, if I'm a worship leader, guys, that's a, that's an easy, simple, um, just this thing you could take and apply into this Sunday morning is shepherding the people through and explaining them why do we do some of these things? Why do we say these things? Because I think that is going to make it so much simpler for people to get behind what's happening. Or, and, and also it's giving them permission to say, hey, you know what? You It's okay. Like It's okay if, if, if you're still struggling with this stuff. It's okay if you want to sit down. It's okay if you want to get on your knees. Giving people permission in this sort of setting, I think, is so valuable, Alan. And I think there's that, that's that line where we go. It's it's from shepherding to to mandating and and demanding, right? It's that thin line there that that man we can really, really, really get into some murky territory with that. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. All right, guys, we got one more uh, point here, and then I believe we're gonna jump into the the real meat of what we want to talk about mm -hmm. today y'all so stay in here stay tight with us because we're going to jump into what you came for which is this idea of should we be listening to this type of music and we're going to camp out there for the rest of the time but before we do i think this might be my last one on this one uh no i just uh this one is just the same thing emotional should be a natural organic byproduct of spirit-filled worship not something should people should be commanded but this is the one that we kind of said was kind of a spoiler alert and that's the idea that sometimes worship leaders OK, now, just being honest, we understand that, like, if we if we can make people sing lyrics that express a romantic relationship with Jesus, it has the power to manipulate people who might be longing for that type of experience. Right. And so, for instance, you know, if, 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 you, if you have a whole bunch of women in the, in the church and you have a song that continues to repeat over and over again, you know, I just love to lay in your arms. I just love to lay in your arms. I just love to lay in your arms. And you start singing that again and again. If you have a lot of women there and maybe they haven't had a lot of attention in a while or maybe they they, they want to visualize them with, I don't know. I don't know. But but you can, you can actually pray and play upon the emotions of people, maybe more so women because women are generally speaking more emotional than men, just generally speaking, okay? And you can kind of pray on that 
once again, with this whole idea of romanticism, we've talked about that a little bit earlier, uh, but we have to be careful that we don't use that as a means for emotional manipulation as well. Yeah, and, and, and Alan, it's been proven that certain songs, or, or excuse me, certain chord progressions are going to create a certain emotional response. Certain words, like the word baby, right? The word baby, and, and, and saying that in a certain rhythm or a certain cadence or a certain repetition can create an emotional response. So there's a, 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 a something they do in movies on purpose when you're watching a movie and, and you don't even know why you're crying, but all of a sudden you're just crying in a movie, right? It's because a combination of the content, the content, combination of the chord structure and the way it's being played out that it's hitting you in an emotional way that we're not even processing and there's this clip um and we don't got to play it but it's sean mendez and he's talking about how he started crying listening to a maverick city worship song maverick city choir worship song and uh, sean mendez is you know like a pop star and then the very next line he goes on to say yeah and then i was also listening to some like old buddhist monk meditation and it did the same thing to me and it's like well was it the was it the spirit of god through the worship song Song, or was it the emotions of certain chord structures and certain dissonance that can be naturally created through music, whether that's a love song, whether that's an upbeat dance song, this can be used and is used a lot of times. You see it at a, a Tony Robbins conference, right? Everyone's jumping around and they literally spend the first 45 minutes just to get you hyped up. So we have to be careful not to take those tactics and, and use them in the church because we shouldn't have to, because we actually have the presence of God. You shouldn't have to say, oh, look what Tony Robbins is doing. Let's Let's take that and let's make people jump around and get hyped up with and hysterical and this sort of thing. Again, if that happens spontaneously, if that happens organically, that's different, but it should come from an overflow and not from a, let me pull on your, your, your heartstrings to create a specific type of response from you. Yeah, exactly. And y'all, uh, once again, along those same lines, try watching one of your favorite movies and remove the entire background track. It ain't going to be the same experience at all, right? Why is there always background music? Why is it that when the pastor at the end of the service, which I'm for this, okay, with the end of the service, when it's altar call, there's always some real slow medley type of, you know, melody kind of going on with like, mm -hmm. in, like strings and like uh, violin strings. It's like, like this, this like pad, right? Because they know that and, and once again there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that okay I, i'm just be clear hear me out that's good because we want people to experience the presence of god but my point is that all of that stuff those chord changes and all that stuff um is, is a way to to cause people to have a certain response a certain reaction okay yeah yeah so, that's good yeah all right so now let's 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 jump in now because this is where this is where i think we want to go all right should Christians listen to music from problematic ministries? Now, when we say problematic ministries, it very well could be any ministry out there. But some of the ones that have been a little bit that that have that have been under scrutiny the most, I'll just phrase it that way. Some of the ones that have been under scrutiny the most as of the last, I don't know, five or 10 years or so have been uh, Bethel music. Hillsong and Elevation. And first and foremost, it is not my intent to lump all three of these ministries into one and say they're all exactly the same. Right. Because he, although all three of them have some different problems related to them as far as their preaching and their theology, they're not all exactly the same. So just be sure that I'm not lumping them all in, okay? But let me give you just a, a brief example of this. And I have a whole video uh, on my channel about Bethel Hill song and elevation. I'll put a link to it below. I'm sure Russ has some stuff as well. Mike Winger as well. But what you see on the screen here is an example of what, of what they call grave soaking or grave sucking. And um, apparently to be fair to Bethel, I don't believe this is something that, that, that most people at the church uh, practice, but it has been documented that, um, that some in their worship uh, ministry or rather they're, they're taught or, or whatnot that if there is someone who is uh, someone who is deceased and they were gifted and anointed and had the spirit of God just all over them, but they were deceased. If you go to their grave and you just lay on their grave, you can soak up some of that anointing and soak up some of that mantle, right? 
uh, so that you can, can kind of soak it up into you so that whatever anointing was on them will then be soaked up and transferred to you. Now, that's just one thing, okay? Now, we could think of, I want to say her name was Olivia uh, a little while back. Um, I think I think she was the daughter of one of the worship leaders, I want to say at Hillsong, who had died. And um, uh, and and what they did was they they rallied around, a, a, they, they got a group of people, right? And they, they were basically praying for days and days and days and not eat, here it is, from what I can remember, they weren't praying and asking God to resurrect this little girl. They were commanding her to come up from the grave. They were commanding her. Now, this girl is dead. Oh, now, yeah. you know, obviously, this is a very sad, couple, crazy situation. A couple situation. days. Yeah, this was at Bethel a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah. a couple years ago, right? And, 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 you know, very sad situation. And I get it. You know, I would be heartbroken if something happened to my daughter as well, right? But, but. To believe that you can command a, a, someone who's in their grave days after they're dead to come up. Obviously, she didn't, right? But these are the types of things that that are being taught, along with some of the other stuff from Bill Johnson saying that Jesus had to go down to hell to suffer, uh, to 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 be punished in hell for our for for our sins, implying that the punishment that he received on the cross wasn't enough. He had to go finish his atonement down in hell things like that, um, equating Jesus and stripping him of his deity and saying he's kind of really just came to earth just to demonstrate to us what a man can do and all this stuff, y'all. It's not proper theology and, and much of it is heretical. So Russ, what are your thoughts on yeah. uh, problematic ministries? <clears throat> well, I mean, specifically with Bethel, I think they're, I'm in proximity. I'm on the West Coast. I know a lot of folks that have gone to church at Bethel, folks that have relocated and, and, and been at that church for years that, I, that, I'm, that I'm friends with. I know folks that have went to their school of ministry. Um, there's a lot of influence around here and around some of the communities that I'm a part of, with specifically with Bethel. So there's real problematic issues with uh, uh, his uh, Bill Johnson's theology. And you guys, again, um, you guys could go check out Mike Winger's video. He does an extensive video and 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 he goes in specifically uh, about his view of his of uh, apostolic equivalence to scripture, and in terms of uh, Paul, some really bizarre views about Paul coming back and having a thorn in his flesh and saying if anyone preaches a different gospel, then they're preaching a false gospel. Like it's it's like and this is Bill in his own words, and Mike Winger does a great job hour long video breaking all that down. So there's actually like really problematic things in their theology. Now, there's also things that out of an overflow and out of, I would say, a, a, an environment and an institution that then comes out of some of this error that they have that then impacts them. And, and I have two specific examples. One example is uh, there, there was a worship leader from around here that went up there, Alan, who was uh, loved the Lord, was was really into Jesus. And I'm not saying this is from Bethel directly. I'm saying this is the type of institution and the type of culture they've created. And they went and he went up there and he was really, very passionate. And what, what happened was that they transition the culture transition or, or someone in leadership influence whatever into the into the tongues and they wanted him to speak in tongues and, and, and this dude didn't get the gift of tongues and was basically made to feel exiled and shunned by the community because he wasn't going to fake tongues he just did he, he didn't get that gift and so it led to him being kind of ex not now say excommunicated but definitely shamed shunned by that specific community and then it, it, it finally culminated to years later that he's not even in church anymore that he's he's he deconstructed his faith completely he's not following jesus and this was someone that was a worship leader and so i say all that to say man bad theology can really hurt people when 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 we're doing some of these things that are coming out and again it's not directly maybe from bill that they're teaching grave robbing i'm not saying they're teaching this stuff from this from the pulpit i'm saying that some of this stuff can get very problematic with the culture and environment that it can create around people i'll give you another example uh i was at a spotify christian mixer alan and it was in la and they had a whole bunch of folks there who were Christian musicians and, 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 you know, in that whole world. And we basically are a rep at Spotify who would get us playlisting. Hey, I'm in LA. We're going to bring everybody together. So there's folks from all the big worship camps, right? This is a couple years ago and we're all hanging out. We're all, we're all engaging. And there was one guy there that was, that was a ex Bethel 
worship pastor. I'm going to keep his uh, name anonymous for somebody could probably figure this out. And we were having this conversation, Alan. And, and so he was talking about, you know, social justice and all these other things and, and all these different issues with the institution of the church and the industrial complex and all that. I'm like, yeah, like I, I hear you on some of that stuff. And then I started kind of poking away at like, so what do you believe now? Like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And Alan, we got to the point where the more questions I asked him, I mean, he, he had completely colored outside the lines of orthodoxy where he basically ended up saying, yeah, I think the resurrection of Jesus could have been, you know, a metaphor. I don't think it was literal. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, like you're way outside the lines of orthodoxy. Like now we're coloring way outside that that, that boundary. And this was like, his songs are, his songs are still getting sung in these uh the, the, a lot of these songs right and so we ended up going to dinner afterwards he like kind of tagged along to go to dinner with us and you know i, I just like heard him out and, and tried to but i'm like man bro you're not a christian like you, you you don't believe in the resurrection like that's if there's anything that's like a minimal requirement prerequisite right. to following yeah. jesus you got to believe the resurrection really happened and he 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 just deconstructed to that point so again mm. this isn't saying what they teach specific some of the stuff they do is bad but what they teach specifically it's the culture and the institution and the environment that's created that has a lot of different problems coming out of it and obviously we, we saw with the hillsong docuseries and the stuff that came out of there on a macro level and so there are definitely problematic things that come out and because music is leveraged and art is leveraged it gets them a ton of influence into these different circles and so they don't really address it like they like bethel tried to do like a podcast Cast series and they didn't re- they addressed the grave robbing thing but they a grave what is a soaking thing but they don't really directly address like man like you said paul came back and preached a different gospel like that's bad like that's really 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 bad <laughs> you know like it, it, it so i think that's the part where we can get really really uh you know problematic with some of these ministries and so it's, it's it's we're not just dunking on them for the sake of dunking on them go do your research and find out some of these things um and it doesn't mean that people who go there are all bad it doesn't mean all the songwriters aren't christians it doesn't mean that they're all on an agenda to twist you into some trick you into some new agent that just means hey we have to be vigilant and look out for the error because bad theology can really hurt people yeah yeah no doubt no doubt so y'all want to give y'all some considerations, some things, you know, uh, so, so that we can, you know, kind of hear from you all for just a second. But first and foremost, um, here's my first piece of advice for you. All right. Don't be prideful or legalistic about it. Now, what I mean here is, um, you know, if you believe that Christians under no circumstance should ever, 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 ever listen to any music from Bethel Hill Song and Elevation, because if you are, you're supporting these ministries, so on and so forth. Okay, I respect you. I understand it. I love you. I respect that, right? But if you're on the other side of the extreme and you're like, you know what? Psh, yeah, I mean, I can listen to whatever music I want as long as it's theologically accurate, as long as it's sound, and as long as it edifies me spiritually, right? My point is, whichever way you lie, whatever, wherever direction you lie, don't be prideful about it to where you're like condemning and putting people down and being nasty and arrogant and and, and sending evil emails to, <laughs> to me, right? Like, like, right, because maybe I have a certain opinion about things. Like, don't be prideful, don't be legalistic about it, right? Understand and respect that this is a debatable issue. It's controversial, right? Um, uh, and so uh, just be careful about being so dogmatic on, on something, some, something like this. Now, yeah, then, and yeah, let me yeah. just piggyback to that, Alan. Yeah. Somebody asked about the Bethel song Champion, right? And there's a problematic lyric in there that you covered that said, when I open my mouth, miracles start breaking out, right? And that's a very much so a uh, like a hyper charismatic position that, that I think Bethel has and is an error about. Now, someone said, well, would you mind if we like, is it okay if we just change the lyric? When God opens his mouth, miracles start breaking out. Well, I would say, yeah, you, yeah, there you go, right? If you, re, as, as, a, as a, yeah, <laughs> as a shepherd in your local church, and a lot of these worship leaders, you are a shepherd, whether you want to hold that title or not, you are pastoring people. You need to look, look over these lyrics and go, well, do I want everyone singing when I open my mouth? Miracles start breaking out. I have the authority Jesus has given me. Uh, maybe I don't want to. Maybe I don't want to have my congregation say that and slowly start to believe that my mouth can create miracles. Now we're getting into some weird manifestation stuff, some new age and stuff. Okay, so just change the look. When God opens, when God opens His mouth, miracles start breaking out. Boom! There you go. We just adjusted it. And, and, and so again, to your point, we don't we don't need to be legalistic about it. If there's a song that you like, but man, some of this is, I don't really know about the theology of this. It's oh, I think it's 
it's more than okay to adjust some of the lyrics um, and, and and keep it moving. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great, great point. I love that point. Um, yeah, so another thing to y'all, and I know some of y'all are going to roast me on this, but listen, this is a fact, all right? God can still use these ministries to bring people to Christ. Now, please, before you send me emails and before you do all this, I am not endorsing these ministries. So yep. let me say that loud and clear. I am not endorsing these <laughs> ministries. So if you're going to soundbite something, soundbite this. Alan Parr is not endorsing Bethel Hillsong and Elevation Ministries. What I am saying is that it is still possible for people to go to these churches and come to Christ, right? And once again, even Paul said this when he was in prison. He said, those others do not have pure motives as they yep. preach about Christ. Now, the context, Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. While he's in prison, there are some other people out there who were jealous of Paul's success. They saw an opportunity for, for them to shine. Think of it like uh, if, uh, if LeBron James gets hurt and you've been sitting on the bench for a long time and now you get your chance to shine because he's hurt. Right. And you're excited about that opportunity. There are some people that got a chance to shine because Paul was in prison and they were speaking against Paul, but they were still also preaching Christ. But they were doing it from selfish ambition, not sincerely. And they noticed Paul said they were intending to make my chains more painful for me, meaning I'm already in in prison. So that's pain enough. But to hear these people talk negatively about me, they're trying to compound the pain that I'm already experiencing because I'm in prison. But then his conclusion is this. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Right. So what Paul is saying here is that, you know what? Yeah, they're 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 uh, they're not sincere. Their ambitions are false. Right. Their motives are not pure. But you know what? What I will praise God about is the fact that somehow, some way, in the sovereignty of God, if God can use a donkey to speak, right, in the Old Testament, then God can even use people from problematic ministries to bring people to Christ. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, Alan Martin Luther once said that God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. Uh, I got a buddy of mine who's in this stream, John Clash, who uh, has a has a YouTube page. He's he's, uh, he's he's blowing up. Shout out to him. And he actually got saved at Hillsong NYC when Carl Lynch was the pastor, right? And so, despite all the institutional issues there, he was still God still used that front door, got him in, and then he got saved there. Was there for a little while, and then transitioned. He has a video about it, and then transitioned into a, a different type of church. So I think God all the time can use whether it's a secret church, whether it's a church with some problematic theology to pull people and, and redeem people onto himself. So I, I'm a hundred percent with you, Alan. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Jamie Harris. Yes. This is really live. All right? <laughs> <laughs> we are live. It's Tuesday, April 5th. All right. Okay. We're going to keep this thing. We're going to, we're going to move this thing along here. So we're not here all day. We respect you all's time, but let me jump through a few more of these. All right. Um, and now this answer, this asks a different question that we may not have time to really get into as much. Um, uh, music from problematic ministries being played at churches could financially support these problematic ministries. Now, um, <laughs> I, I don't want to really touch this one too much in this particular stream. I wanted to focus more on should individual Christians listen to this music or not? Okay. But this is another question that you really need to really ask and answer if you're a worship pastor or if you're a uh, you know, leader of a church, because as Ruslan mentioned earlier, there's this thing called CCLI. Uh, I want to say it's Christian something licensing in, in, in institution or whatever. But basically, in order for churches, if they're going to be really on the up and up, if churches are wanting to use the music uh, in their church services, they have to pay a licensing fee that will allow them to use this music in their church. Well, part of that money from the licensing fee goes to support these ministries. And so this is one of the main arguments that many people who believe that churches need to ban and boycott these ministries or the music from these ministries is that, hey, you know what? You are actually financially supporting a movement that is promoting false doctrine. Now, that's a different question than whether I should listen to it. If I'm in my car and I ain't hurting nobody, 
I'm in my car. Now you can make a case, which I'm going to make in just a second. You can make a case. Well, if you're listening to it on Spotify, you're paying for this and that's money's going. Okay. I'm gonna make a case for that in a second. Don't worry about that. All right. I got something waiting for you on that, but all right. <laughs> but the thing is, is that this is, this is a, this is something that, um, music leaders and, and pastors really need to consider. And by the way, there's a phenomenal video. I'll try to remember to link it below, but you're really, really going to want to check it out. It's on uh, my friend's channel, Todd Friel. His name of his channel is Wretched Radio or Wretched TV. All right. And he has a, 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 it'll be linked below, but he has a video where he interviews another friend of mine, Justin Peters. You may be familiar with Justin Peters, who has a, a great discernment ministry. Uh, and he's done a lot of work on word of faith movement and things like that. And, uh, um, and he talks about the danger of playing this music and supporting this music. You should definitely check that video out. It's about 20 minutes long. Yeah. And, and just, just to piggyback on this, Alan, this is a, this is, this is a hundred million dollar industry. Like this is not small potatoes. This is huge. And, and the, the, the side from a, from a songwriter side, that's been problematic on this is that a lot of times the artists writing these songs from these problematic ministries have very unfair publishing arrangements. So you might be a writer under Bethel or under Hillsong, uh, and and not actually be seeing any of the CCLI. So you might be writing some of these songs and it may not even be going based on how the publishing arrangement, because what a lot of these churches did, which is which was smart from their perspective, is they pivoted and they started running record labels and publishing companies. So here, we're, now we're answering like, is that even ethical? Where in the Hillsong documentary of their band, some of the musicians couldn't even afford to buy a house in the area that they lived in to be a part. And mo mo all along, they're selling tens of, you know, five, 10 million records and they don't own any of the publishing, but yet they're contributing to these stuff. That's why I think it get really problematic because what, they're, what, what they've done, and I'm not saying every church does this, I'm saying what they've done historically is it basically becomes work for hire because we have the brand, we can kind of cheat you out of your publishing and then you're not in a, in a, in a fair situation and that money's flowing back to some of these mega ministries and the actual songwriters weren't always being compensated. The musician or being compensated properly weren't being compensated. The musicians weren't being compensated properly. And so you have, you know, someone's doing, uh, you know, Hillsong hundred million uh, a year operation. Yet some of the guys writing these records, some of the musicians on this weren't being adequately taken care of and weren't able to do simple things like just buy a home for their family, you know, yet, their records are ma making tons and tons of money. So I think that's a whole nother layer to the CCLI thing that there's a lot of folks out here getting rich uh, in that world. And there's nothing wrong with earning money. It's just, man, it could, it, it could, it could position it to be more problematic than not. Yes, absolutely. Ruslan, somebody wants to, has a question for you. I don't know if you can see the comment on the screen. Why, why do you look mad when you read? <laughs> I don't know, Esvin. I'm just, I just, I guess, I guess my, uh, my, my resting face is uh, one of intense passion. It's the Armenian in me. <laughs> oh man, you know what? We all needed a good laugh, y'all. And that was fun. Esvin, thank you for that laugh. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Okay. All right. We're going to keep this thing moving because there's a couple more uh, points that I have and then, and then we'll, we'll be good y'all. Um, okay. Now, this is the next one here, and this is what I want to talk about. Canceling music from entire ministries is a slippery slope. Now, what do I mean by that? You have some people out there, hear me out now, and they'll say, you know what? You should not listen to this music as a Christian because you are financially in some way, let's say you go purchase a CD, or let's say you go purchase a stream, let's say you stream their music from Spotify. A certain amount of money that you uh, that you pay to Spotify every month is going to go towards that church or that ministry, which is false. So you're supporting these ministries by streaming their music, right? Now, to me personally, you can let me know in the comments if you disagree, but I think that this is a slippery slope because if you decide to do that, I want y'all to cancel all these services on the screen right here. It's all gone. Cancel them all. <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap. You better go right now. Don't be hypocritical now. Go to Netflix. Cancel your Netflix account because your $14.99 a month or whatever you pay because it keeps going up every month. Seems like it. Used to be $9.99. Now it's like $19.99 if you want HD, right? But the point is, whatever you're paying every month for Netflix, there's a portion of that that is going towards creating content that is totally not biblical. It's not ethical. It might be, you know, I'm just going to leave it to that, right? It's not. 
And then you got um, Hulu, okay, Apple TV, Amazon Prime, and you know what? Even Spotify. Just cancel your Spotify too. Because by paying Spotify, you're also supporting gangster rap. You're also supporting mm -hmm. music that has uh, uh, that that um, uh, objectifies women and things like that with cursing and all sorts of stuff. So, so you can't just say, well, you should cancel these ministries because a certain amount of money that you spend is going towards uh, supporting these ministries and those ministries are false. But yet I'm still going to pay even more money every month to these other services who are also promoting other things that are way more false. Right. Yeah. So I'm just saying that 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 to me is a kind of a weak argument to use. But if you want to use that argument, you need to go all the way and cancel everything. Cancel cable. I mean, hey, take your kids out of private school because I don't, I don't know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because some yeah. some money that you're paying somewhere. Uh, stop buying groceries at the store. I don't know who, who knows where that money is going to go. Right. You, you don't know where every penny that you put somewhere is going to go. To me, that's a slippery slope. Yeah, it's called the origin fallacy, Alan. It, it, it's the fallacy that because something could be questionable or problematic in, in or origin, then you have to completely dis discard all of it. And the truth is, there probably are some things that some of us should cancel. <laughs> some of you guys are probably watching too much Netflix. So you need to st stop. The average American watches 30 hours of Netflix a week. So some of that is, is it, you. some of you guys may need to cancel your Netflix, right? I think if we keep seeing some of this stuff come out of Disney with like intentionally creating characters that are specifically supporting LGBTQ uh, agenda and that and that we, we take our kids to Disney World and all of a sudden that's a thing right I think that's that's where we got to be really 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 uh, you got to have just scales in that regard and 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 I would add to that Alan what I would I think the solution to this is support and platform ministries and musicians that you do believe in right there's a lot of brothers that are coming up that are doing amazing amazing worship music uh one of my personal friends Antoine Bradford check him out solid theologically loves Jesus in a local church I've known him for over a decade and he writes really theologically rich songs that slap and are awesome and sound good and feel good. And 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 he's really, I think he's kind of like a prototype. So like, if you feel that way, maybe one of the better things to do is to sh to, to support the ministries and the artists that you want to see platformed uh, that, that are doing good work and maybe go the extra mile. If you're going to listen and pay 10 bucks a month for Spotify, okay, I'm not mad at you. Maybe what the independent artists that are doing it without a major, you know, mega church behind them, maybe you go buy their albums, maybe you go buy their merch, maybe you go the extra mile to really get behind them because they could feel it more. And so there's a list of artists that I could, that I could talk about that I just think are doing it the right way. Theological, content the music is phenomenal i mean again look up antoine bradford you guys will have your mind blown by how incredibly powerful and quality the music is and theologically rich the music is that i think there's so many things to support so instead of saying hey we're gonna do this and that, that, then we start coming off like cancel culture then we start coming off like the world in my opinion right yeah. um and again if you're conflicted on something, follow your conscience, right? Follow your conscience. I, I'm, I'm watching this Disney situation. Like I sure, I'm sure you are, Alan. I'm like, man, we're going. Maybe we won't go back to Disneyland for a while, you know, if until they get their act together. If they're really going to be promoting this like 50% quota of, uh, you know, the, 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 these types of characters. Okay, yeah, we probably. I mean, we don't really watch Disney like that. We don't have Disney Plus, but maybe we won't go to Disneyland or Disney World with my family. I don't know. We're watching and watching close, but I think the, the alternative, in my opinion, is support the ministries you believe in and go above and beyond to go and get the the merch from a I am rescued or from an Antoine Bradford and really get behind those ministries because I think that is how we start building culture and that is how we start impacting change is by platforming brothers we believe in instead of just wagging our finger at the problematic stuff yeah no doubt no doubt absolutely y'all okay we're gonna just uh um, we're gonna throw a couple other ones at you and then we're gonna be done I promise because we already been going an hour and 40 minutes all right but check this out Here's a, something to consider, okay? You, you know, whenever we whenever we cancel a song, when we say, I will not listen to this song, no matter who wrote it, if we say, I'm not gonna listen to this song because it was pro, pro published by Bethel, right? I want you to consider this, and this is something I just thought about early, earlier today as I was putting these slides together. Would you read a theologically sound book, a perfectly theologically sound book, 
written by someone who is on staff at a problematic ministry. Mm. Let's say I'm on staff at, at, at Bethel, but I write a phenomenal book about marriage because I'm an expert about marriage. And everything in that book will help you with your marriage, and it's all straight from the Bible. Not one theological error. But Bethel Church produces this book, right? Are you going to say, I boycott and ban that book because it was produced or promoted by Bethel Church? Or are you going to say, wait a second, hold on, let me just slow down here. First of all, the dude that wrote this book, who's going to get some money from it, right? Unless he signed all of his rights away, but let's say he gets some money from it. Like he put his heart and soul into this, he or she, and, and it's great stuff and it's good. And second of all, this book is actually going to bless my spirit. Like this could help my marriage, right? This could edify me. And I think that that's the whole issue with throwing out a song and saying, I will not listen to it because of who it is because Bethel wrote it or Hillsong or Elevation wrote it, as opposed to saying, wait, hold on a second. The guy that wrote this song probably really loves Jesus. So you got to be careful not to judge people. He probably really does love Jesus, even though his church has some issues. Does he need to leave the church? Probably so. But he probably does genuinely love Jesus. And out of that love for Jesus, he wrote this amazing song with these great lyrics. You know what? I don't see any problem listening to it. Like I said, churches, whether, whether you want to put him on a Sunday morning, that's up to you. You guys have to figure that out. But from an individual standpoint, my position is, you know what? If a song edifies me and it's theologically accurate, I am still going to sing that song. And I am, that's me. If you don't like it, if you want to unsubscribe, I get it. I, I understand. But that's my position. If I like the song, it edifies me. It's theologically accurate. It helps me understand the heart of God more. I'm still going to listen to it. But as I said in my video, the reason why I feel I, that I'm able to do that is because, and I'm not boasting, I'm at a point in my walk, you all, where if I do listen to music from Bethel Hillsong Elevation or anyone, or if I hear a sermon from anyone, it doesn't have to be music that you have to just be discerning for. You have to discern blogs. You have to discern music. You have to discern sermons. You have to discern YouTube videos. You have to discern everything. I'm at a point where I can listen to something from anyone and say, whoa, 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 hold on. Okay, this video was good by this brother, but this one is off. Well, wait, this, this song that this person wrote was good, but this one is off. And so you, you start to go through that discernment process and you kind of go from there. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I think, you're, I think you're spot on, Alan. I think the goal for everyone watching this is be good Bereans. Read your Bibles. Know what the truth is. Know what the actual gospel is. Know what good sound doctrine is. So that way you'll be more likely to spot out the counterfeit or something that's an error uh, instead of just avoiding everything and living your life in a, in a Christian bubble or not even a Christian bubble, a, a, a your theological camp is the only right camp bubble. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather you be able able to process and know the difference than to sustain to then to completely absolve yourself from anything because again in my opinion I think we we should be building culture and not copying culture we should be uh, the head and not the tail we shouldn't just be sitting back and saying well these things are happening guess what no no, no. you should know the scriptures and then you should contribute something it, it, to, to the, if you're a worship leader contribute something better in my opinion that's that's how I would look at it yeah now, Yvette makes a good point. Maybe you can do that, Alan, but new believers can't do that, and they are being led to hell by Hillsongs and Bethel. Okay, so um, I would be a little bit more careful saying they're being led to hell by a Hillsong and Bethel because the reality is that um, you know they might be being led by uh, they might be under some significant false teaching in certain areas that might affect how they think, how they act, um, and, and maybe ultimately, but you don't know if that person is actually gonna go to hell, right? I mean, they, I was under false teaching for years in college and the Lord blessed me to come out of that, right? So just be a little bit more careful when you say, well, they're being led to hell. It might definitely be being, being misled, but um, let, let's, let's uh, but you're right. And that, that kind of leads me into this point, I believe is my next one, which is, I think this is one of my last ones here, which is um, if the music is played at church, it is possible that weaker Christians could potentially begin to follow their ministry and doctrine. And this is a very, very possible thing. And you have to understand that is the issue oftentimes with 
some of these ministries is that they're not going to come out. This is what Justin Peters says in the video that I wanted to make you guys check out, let, let you guys check out. They're not going to just come out with a song that says Jesus is not God and he uh, you know, is, is only a man and he's not, he, he never, he never died on the cross. Like they know that no church in the country is ever going to play that song at their service. So they're not going to introduce false doctrine in that type of way. But what they do is in little subtle ways, like in the song champion, where 99.99% of that song is perfect, but then they weave in a little bit of word, faith, theology, they weave in a little bit of little God's theology, the positive confession. I speak this thing and miracles start breaking out. They weave that in. And so when you're at church and you're singing this song and you're overwhelmed with all this emotion, and then you look at the bottom of the screen and it says Bethel music, a new Christian could see that and be like, oh, wait, Bethel music. That's cool. Let me go find out some more songs from Bethel music. Let me go look them up on Spotify. Let me go save them to my playlist. Let me go check them out. The next thing you know, because they saw a song that that church promoted in church, it says Bethel music at the bottom of the screen because you got to put it there for the CCLA license. And then a new Christian thinks that well, if my church says it's fine and we're singing their songs, then after mm -hmm. all, then my church put, puts their stamp of approval on it so that I can go listen to it myself. And they're not at a place, to your point, Yvette, where they're able to discern truth from error. And then not only do they listen to this music and put it on their playlist, they might even start going to YouTube and start checking out some of their sermons. That is possible. It's probably not probable. <laughs> probably not, it's probably not something that happens very often if I'm just being honest. Okay, right. let's be honest about it. Most people don't do that, but it is possible. It is possible, and I'm sure it happens. Yeah, and it's the heart behind, is someone going to get tricked into going to hell? I think that's the part where I go, oh, like, because because then you're like, man, they're, they'll get led. Okay, no, I think people who go to hell are ultimately and flippantly rejecting Jesus and living their life as their own God. Right. And, 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 and I think in a dying in their sin like that, that is different than someone that's going to me. Yes. Maybe they'll go and, 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 and they'll go through a season of some sketchy teaching, uh, go through a season of, Oh, what about this guy? What about this guy? But I believe God's going to finish the work that he started. I believe if someone's genuinely born again, that they will eventually process in the sanctification process, grow and evolve and land in a healthy place with their theology, with their doctrine, with their lifestyle. So that would be my my uh, my statement to that is like it's possible, but I think that takes the presupposition that people are getting tricked into going to hell by worship music. And that just, I just think is such a logical inconsistency to jump to a conclusion like that. I think you're really reaching. That doesn't negate the fact that there's error. It's just, is error in, in, in a, in the ministry downstream through music going to cause people to go to hell? I would say you're reaching. I think, I think that's a big reach. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think so. And I think y'all, I think I have one last one. Um, yeah. And I think this was all, all I said was, and this is where I land. I'm not talking about churches, but this is where I land. I said this earlier for your personal enrichment, be led by the spirit and assess each song based on its theological accuracy. But I do believe that this is an issue of conscience. Whereas if the Lord is really convicting you about listening to their music, supporting their music, streaming their music, then you know what? By all means for you, like listen to that, right? Yep. Like follow that. Make sure that, you know, if by, like the Bible says, if eating meat for you is, causes you to sin, then don't eat meat, right? But don't judge your brother who's eating meat, whose conscience doesn't matter. Like, like yeah. so just be careful about the judging piece. But if, if, if the Lord has put this strong on your heart, then by all means, go and buy, boycott and ban. And, 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 and we won't judge you. But we appreciate if you don't judge other people who might have um, more freedom, right? Paul talks about people who have mm -hmm. a weaker conscience and a stronger conscience. Right. Uh, and, and some have a little bit more freedom. Uh, so just just be careful with that. And y'all with that, that's all that we have to say about this. And I'm going to let uh, Russ, you know, maybe uh, uh, add a couple of comments and then um, show you, tell you guys where you guys can support our ministries and things like that. Uh, we know we've been on here about two hours. It's been a long time. Uh, no, no, not two hours. My bad. We started at one thirty. An hour and right. a half. Yeah. Oh, okay. I keep, saying, I keep thinking we started at one. That's right. It ain't been. I was about to say two hours is a long time. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. I yeah. 
I think uh, I think I think it's totally spot on. And he, here's the here's the those of you guys that feel very strongly about it. Just be careful that your abstinence is not used as a measurement for your holiness. Don't mm -hmm. don't weaponize your abstinence from something as a measurement of your holiness that you're better than anyone. Uh, if I'm honest, if I'm frank with you guys, I do really struggle with separating the artist from the art. This is a struggle of mine, and I gave Alan the example that the, uh, you know, by and large, society as a whole has kind of discarded R. Kelly. We go, yeah, this man is wild. Like the, we were not we're not rocking with him. Spotify, oh. everybody, right? But R. Kelly put out. A pretty fire gospel album in 2004. Yeah, I can't bring myself Treating to listen to that gospel. Life, yeah, it's it's so you. good. It's such yeah, a great, yeah, yeah. such a great gospel <laughs> album. I can't bring myself to listen to that gospel album, even if there are songs on there. He got a song called uh, "You Save Me." It's a straight vertical song yeah. saying how do you save me? Oh, oh my God, gosh, it was <laughs> amazing record. I, okay, my conscience, I I can't do that. I can't go there like I, yeah. I can't go there but if someone else is like oh you remember this this arcade this came up today on my youtube this thing slaps i'm not going to be like oh i'm choosing to abstain do you not know how evil r kelly is i'm choosing to abstain don't do don't do that because because you are the one that then starts sliding into pride and the toughest part about pride is you usually don't know that you're the one being prideful with your with your abstaining from certain things so i would just caution you guys uh press it to the scriptures everybody's like what about we christians what about we christians hey the reason why alan parr's ministry exists the reason why my ministry exists is so that there's be less we christians so that we can help you guys grow up so that you guys could get on the meat so that you guys can be equipped so that you guys can be good Bereans so you could think through culture and music and art critically and not just following along and letting someone else do all the thinking for you and telling you what is and isn't appropriate become good Bereans study the scriptures press in feed yourselves not just living off of meat that that would be my, my biggest takeaway uh for people here Alan yeah yeah no doubt okay <laughs> so you, that was a perfect way to end man because <laughs> thing, man See, let's see, see, I, see, see, oh man. So, so, so see, if, if I wasn't afraid of y'all judging me, I'd probably let y'all in on some of the things that are in my mind right now. But if I, if I let you <laughs> in my mind, then I know that some of y'all would just say I'm worldly, but I'll just say this, you know what, you know, I mean, it, it, it that, that's a tough, that's a tough conversation to have. And, 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 and not only just thinking about their gospel music, right. But, you know, some of their other music. I mean, if I'll be honest with you, you know, before I truly became sanctified in the Lord, I, I listened to all the R. Kelly music and all that stuff. Right. But um, I had to I had to let all of that stuff go um, when the Lord began to sanctify me. And the reason why I was saying y'all going to joke at me, because I was going to start to sing some of the R. Kelly song. Y'all be like, what? <laughs> you know, them? what's wrong with you? Like, yeah, because 20 some years ago when I used to listen to that stuff and that's a perfect way to end. That's the power of music. Mm. That's how powerful music is. That's why music and sometimes can be even more powerful than sermons because you probably can't quote a sermon from your pastor from 20 years ago, but I guarantee you there's music that has been embedded in your mind and your heart and your spirit from years and years ago that you are still singing that at any moment, you may not have sang that song in 15 years, yeah. but at any moment, the, little, the, the intro to that song can play and all those lyrics just come right up. That's the power that music has. And that's why we need to be careful about the type of music that we put in, your, in our spirit, whether it's Christian music or whether it is secular music. Come on. Because it can get deep in our spirit to where we're starting to sing those songs again and again. And you could be like me 20 years later on a live stream Ruslan getting ready to sing I Can't Sleep from R. Kelly. Okay, now don't, 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 look at that. don't, don't, don't go look at that song. That's actually one of his cleaner songs. All right. All right. But but it's a song that I used to listen to and I know all the lyrics of them. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and and it's not I don't listen to it, but I remember it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so so just be aware that that's the powerful music is. And with that being said, before some of y'all call me a heretic because I just quoted an R. Kelly song, it might be. Time. You know, they're going to stop this up, Alan. You know, they're going to. Alan, R. Kelly. He knows yeah. R. Kelly songs. Oh, Alan endorses R. Kelly, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see somebody doing a, a reaction video tomorrow. Uh, Christian YouTuber Alan Parr endorses R. Kelly's music. <laughs>
No, yeah. The point no, of that, guys, no. the point of that was I was saying I can't listen to her. Some of y'all got that completely. Just, I'm saying right. I can't, can't anymore in good conscience. Even I believe I can fly. Even that gospel album, I can't. And that's and and so that I have to draw the line. But some people, hey, you know, they like I believe I can fly. They throw that on at a wedding or I don't know yeah. the, something and they, they could jam out to it. I'm, I can't go there. Yeah, this person said I memorize sermons better than music. Oh, praise oh, God! Respect, all right, respect. All right. Exactly, you're better than me. All right. Well, y'all, I, I, I wish we had more time to kind of uh, you know answer some questions and get some feedback and stuff. But we do try to keep these streams to about 90 minutes or so. And I know we started a little bit late. Uh, we had a little technical difficulties as well. So if my time estimates were about uh, about 90 minutes or so, so. With that being said, guys, um, Russ, how can they support what you're doing? Because listen, guys, I would be remiss, okay? I'd be remiss if I did not mention this, okay? Um, and I'm just going to speak for for Russ and, and myself, all right? Um, everything that you see us doing, uh, it, it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not free, all right? It's not, it's, it's not something that uh, doesn't cost us money. Uh, both Russ and I have people that we that we hire. We have teams. I have a team of 11 people. All right. Russ has a team, people that help him pull this off. Uh, we've got lights. We've got equipment. We've got studio stuff. We've got computers and things like that. Now, I know Russ well enough and I, and I know myself. We, we don't ever ask for money. But all I'm going to say is this. If you are being blessed by our ministries. And let me just go a little bit further. If you're being blessed by Mike Winger. If you're being blessed by John McRae, if you're being blessed by Melissa Doherty, if you're being blessed by Elisa Childers, if you're being blessed by Frank Turek, look, don't give it to us. Give it away. Don't give it to us, right? Just give it away. Give it to someone else, right? This isn't about helping us. It's about, look, we're all here trying to do this and we're trying to, to, to really, um, you know, uh, preach the gospel and help people get saved and help people know Jesus, right? So if you don't support us, Go support your other favorite YouTube. Go support Daniel uh, yeah. from DLM. Go support Joe Kirby. Go support these people that are doing great work. If I missed anybody, please forgive me. All right. But um, go support them because, you know, more than likely they're doing it out of their own pocket, out of their own family's money, their only family resources. And so, um, you know, if you want to support us, you can go to um, alanpar.com forward slash support. And you can pledge your support there. We are a nonprofit, 501c3. Russ, I know you have a Patreon page. Uh, you want to tell them about that so they can yeah, yeah. help you there. You guys could just click the YouTube link to, to uh, from this video. Check out my YouTube. We have a Patreon community uh, that we do like Zoom calls and stuff like that, Q&A. Uh, we're doing one this Sunday, actually. And so, yeah, by all means, if you guys want to partner with us in that way, Patreon is just the easiest way to do it. Awesome. Awesome, y'all. Well, hey guys, God bless. And somebody said, y'all going as long as Mike Winger. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Mike Winger, man. Shout out to Mike. Check out Mike <laughs> Winger's video on Bethel. If you got those of you guys that love Bethel, check out Mike Winger's video on Bethel. It's it's uh, it's good. Yeah, we're going to try to put all those links down below. But hey, y'all, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Um, if, this is, if this is something you want Russ and I to do every so often, maybe once every couple months, we'll hop on. We're good friends. This was super easy for us to put together in a short period of time. There's some other topics I know we're both passionate about. And we'll jump on. Maybe we'll bring in John next time, have three people talking. But hey, love you all. Thank you so much for your support and for your uh, encouragement and for subscribing, for sharing, for commenting. We love you all so much. And uh, I'll see y'all on Friday for my next video. Russ will probably see you in about five minutes when he releases another <laughs> video because he does like five videos a day. I can't keep one, up. One, just right? one a day, one a day.